Oh, hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am not Jared Hartzler. I am uh, Helen Buck Pavlik with the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, um, but um, we are using the Alliance Zoom, so um, it does appear in the recording that I will be Jared Hartzler today. Um, as we're coming in, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. I invite everybody to put into the chat uh, their name, what, where you are from, um, your school, your organization, uh, what grade level uh, you work with, uh, what subject area, and what is your superpower? And I'll drop this in the chat right now as well for you. Just so we can have an idea of who's in the room with us today. And you are free to interpret superpower. For those of you who have already started sharing. I love teacher superpowers. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing that. If you are coming in, um, we are um, inviting everyone to share their name, their place of work, um, the grade level of students that you work with, uh, the subject that you teach, and your teaching superpower. And we'll get started in about one more minute. All right, so thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, again, my name is not Jared Hartzler, as it says on the screen, my name is Helen Buck Pavlik and I serve as the Fine Arts Education Specialist with the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. Um, we are using the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education Zoom link today. Um, so thank you to the Alliance for allowing us to use that for our gathering today. For those of you that are coming in, um, please drop your name. Uh, the place or school that you're, you work at, your grade level, subject and superpower, your teaching superpower in the chat. Um, and welcome to Blurred Borders, how can the Smithsonian American Art Museum help you teach session one of two. Um, we will have a part two session at the same time next week. Uh, so please come back and join us for more incredible information. Microphones were muted for all participants upon entry. Please keep them muted to dis, uh, reduce distractions for other participants. Please respect all participants by not disturbing the meeting with annotations, sounds, or images. We do reserve the right to remove participations if necessary. Today's session is being recorded and it will be available for playback on the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education YouTube channel. There will be a question and answer period following the presentation, so please use the chat function to ask questions regarding today's topic. Please stay focused and don't overflow the chat with excessive banter or side conversations. However, if you do at any time have a question, um, please feel free to use the chat um, or if appropriate, um, unmute to ask your question as well. We uh, would like to have this session be uh, participatory. I'd like to thank all of the partners that um, bring these Blurred Borders professional learning opportunities um, into existence, that would be the Ohio Arts Council, the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education, Ohio Dance, Ohio Music Education Association, the Ohio Art Education Association, and the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. And if we have any of our partners here today, thank you for being with us. So I am very, very excited to introduce Peg. 
the REACH Education Specialist, uh, which stands for Rural Engagement in Art, Culture, and History from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, who's going to talk to us today about how the Smithsonian American Art Museum can help you teach. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> and if everybody can hear me, you'll notice behind me is an image of my museum that we share with the National Portrait Gallery. And I am going to be going with you, going, taking you through today through a number of different things. So be ready because it's going to be taking you on trips that are going to be focused on content as well as strategies. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a second. But first, I want to mention that if you're not familiar with the Smithsonian Institution, we are one of 19 brick and mortar museums that we have now. We have it on the drafting table, two more museums to come. And I'm gonna be using artworks from our collection. We luckily have digitized almost 45,000 artworks. And you're gonna be learning throughout this, how to be able to access those, as well as all the digitized artifacts and resources throughout the whole Smithsonian. So part two is going to be you helping to decide the content of what I'm going to cover. So today, what I'm going to introduce you to are all the free resources that we have. And then I'm going to next week introduce you to more in-depth specific resources. But I need your help to know what you want me to focus on, what those subjects are. You're going to have a better idea today when I take you through how we use our artworks to teach not only visual arts, but also you know the whole across the subject matter. And that'll give you an idea of what to think about for next week. So stick with us because it's gonna be a great ride. What I wanna do is start keying up the PowerPoint. And as Helen said, please, if you've got any questions throughout this, please make sure that you put them in the chat box. I'm not gonna be able to see that once we start with this. And as Helen knows, I wanna make sure you see my slides full screen. Yes, great, thanks. I wanna also mention that everything I'm gonna be talking with you about today are all in the notes sections of this PowerPoint. So you're gonna have access to everything. There is no way I'm gonna be able to cover all the information that is in the notes, but any video I show you, any questions I ask you, any references I make and all the information about the artists and their biographies, everything is in the notes. So make sure you get this PowerPoint so you have access to that. So as I mentioned, this is my building. We share it with the National Portrait Gallery. We have a, a great history to the building, which I'm not gonna go into in depth, but just to tweak your curiosity. We are the third federal building that was built in Washington, DC. And originally we were inventions. If you had an invention and you wanted to be able to get it patented, the patent building, and just think about that for a minute. Of all the things you could build in a new nation, Think about what it meant to have a building devoted to patents. And some of those are in our collection, but eventually it became part of the Smithsonian and we were able to move in, <clears throat> excuse me, with the artworks. So next, I wanna introduce you to some resources you can access on our website. Again, these are all free. Let me give you some examples. We've got professional development webinars that are held across the year. You can sign up for these. Again, they're free. Anything that was done in previous time that's been recorded, you can download those archive recordings. We also have teacher guides and resources. Some of them go into specific subject areas that you see down here. And we also have things that go across a broad span of how to look at art. A lot of these are available in English and Spanish that you can download. We also have examples of things that you can use at home or again, adapt them to the classroom. In particular, there are two social emotional learning toolkits, again, downloadable in English and Spanish. We also have summer institutes for teachers. These are applied 
through an essay that you write, and then you can come to DC, spend about a week behind the scenes with us, learning about how to take what's in our collection and use that to be able to teach your curriculum. And we have Artful Connections, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit, but these are 11 topics that you can see we offer from 3rd to 12th grade. These topics are taught with a core of volunteers that we have, which is one reason why we're able to give them for free. And I'm going to go into those in a little bit more in depth. But I just want to introduce you to the idea that we have videos where you can meet an artist and hear about their inspiration and why they created something. I tucked this one in here, but I'm not going to play it right now because you're going to have a chance to hear that when we go back to those 11 topics. I do want to introduce you to what we call Reframe. And these are short videos where we linked up with colleagues in another Smithsonian museum. You may, as you look across the top here, notice that the last one says a whole lot of beer. I was really thrilled to learn that American History hired a beer curator. And so we went and spoke to them and made connections between that and articles and artworks in our collection that have to do with drinking. We also have conservation. Our museum has nine, <clears throat> excuse me, conservation labs. Most of them are available for you to walk through and be able to see somebody repairing frames, being able to do uh, work on paintings. And you'll notice there's a media lab because we collect media, time-based media. And that includes video games. We are one of the first art museums to collect those. And you'll have access to those when I introduce you to the other resources. So putting all this together, there's a lot there for you to be able to utilize. Then, oh, excuse me, it wants to play, but I'm gonna keep going here. I wanna play you an example of a video that we would use in the course of a video conference. This happens to be Mark Bradford standing in front of his work, Amendment Number 8. For the sake of time today, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I just want you to listen a little bit to how he explains what motivated him and why he wanted to create a piece of the type that it is. This is just going to give you a flavor of what it's like to listen to an artist in front of a work in our collection. So by a binder, I always saw it as pigment dried in a binder and cut into eight and a half by 11 blocks. So just in my head, I thought, oh, well, you just have to wet it so that it can move like paint. What constitutes a painting, sort of, and who, is the, who are the gatekeepers of that? I think that, I'm sure that me being a painter was a very political gesture for me. If you're black and from South Central, you have a lot of like identity stuff that you could just fall right into. And I just thought I was going to do abstract work, but it was going to talk about race and class and culture and all these things, but I was going to do it from an, um, um, an abstraction place, which gave me freedom. And then I was going to look outside. I wasn't going to do this kind of hermetic interior, close the world off, which is historically what we understand abstraction as being. I was going to have relationship with the world and with politics because I was interested in those things. I was really starting to get very interested in the, founda the foundations of our country and the amendments or the Bill of Rights are still what we go to. And interesting enough, it is on paper. I mean, it is one of our historical documents, one of our most important documents are on paper. And also, it's, we put paper in the, in the photo, photocopier. So, so let me stop it there and give you a couple of ideas. If I was doing a video conference with your students and wanted to show this video, I would first talk to you about what your goals are, what standards you're trying to teach. And then I would think what question I would ask to help students focus and be able to glean that information from this video to help them learn that standard. 
So with that in mind, let me pose some possibilities to you. And if you want to respond in the chat box as to what might be a way you want, want to take this, please do. So for example, you last thing he talked about was paper. Maybe before showing this video, I would ask them how they utilize paper. How do they encounter that in their life? And have them start thinking about all those different ways. And then ask them, when is paper valuable? When is it not? And so far, I've not mentioned anything about government. I might instead ask them to take a look at this video without telling them any background and ask them what words they can pick out, if any at all. And then might describe to them the process by which Mark Bradford created this piece, where he was actually collecting flyers and posters from what's nailed up to construction sites, telephone poles, stacking them on top of each other, and then uh, stenciling the letters on top, adding paint, and then taking a sander and sanding down through them. So he's actually using cruel and unusual punishment to create this piece, which are some of the words in amendment number eight. And backing up from that, talking about him wanting to be able to put together something that to him represents a right that everybody has, but how is that being used or not used legally? So any thoughts? I just mentioned some very different ways to approach this vid video. Any thoughts from any of you? And if you want to unmute as to what approach you might use with this with your students. And again, if you were going to utilize this in one of the video conferences that we would do with your students, we'd work this all out ahead of time so you would know what kind of approach we're using and it would support what you're trying to teach. Any thoughts, Helen, that have come in? We did have one comment that um, says that they love the idea about thinking about paper and they would tie that, that would tie in well with the learning about Picasso and modern art. Ah, okay. Thank you. So now you're going to get a flavor of what I'm going to be doing with you throughout the rest of the well, It's both precious and not precious at all. It's both I am going to be asking you to think like teachers, but I'm also going to be giving you different strategies, just like this one that I've introduced you to, to get you thinking about different ways to utilize the resources you can find through my museum. All right, so let's see if I can get one more resource in here. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, Recording the Changing Nation. I'm not going to read all this, but you get the idea that we have in our collection photographs taken of different communities across the United States. And one of my colleagues focused on the photographs taken in Baltimore, since we're so close to Baltimore. And she linked up with a photographer there and people in charge of after-school programs for middle schoolers and high schoolers and ask them to go out and photograph their neighborhoods compared to the original photographs and document the changes that have taken place. Now that's a really brief description of this project, but if you go to this resource, you're gonna be able to have access to interviews of the photographers. You're gonna be able to see the students work. There's gonna be comprehensive lesson plans there. And so the reason I'm mentioning this is because it, the structure that's there can easily be adapted to any grade level. And just the idea of thinking about having students take responsibility for their community, I wanted to make sure you knew about this particular resource. So I mentioned about video conferencing and it's under the umbrella called Artful Connections. And what we do is ask to come directly into your classroom. It's not an assembly. If you teach five to eight classes a day, we'll do five to eight different video conferences because we wanna have a conversation going with your students. And again, it's all free and we do it at the time that your classes are in session. 
So these are the 11 topics that I mentioned. And the way I've organized this PowerPoint is that you can go to any one of these topics, click on it, and it'll take you directly to those slides. Now, again, because of the time today, I'm not gonna be able to go in depth on any of these, but I've put enough slides in for each of these topics to give you a flavor and idea of what all the different ideas are that we can cover. So I've asked Helen to be ready to have you put in the chat box what topic you would like to have me go to. And she's gonna quick take a survey of what everyone would like to see. And we've got time to cover a good four or five of these. When at least you'll know the rest are there for you to be able to look at in the PowerPoint. And let me mention that the REACH resources below here are what we're gonna cover next week. And I will be introducing the Learning Lab with the last few minutes that we have today. All so right, Helen. so I see several responses that said to see is to think. Um, and then I'm gonna write down the others so we can get a list for a couple of follow-ups. Okay, great idea. So I will start with that. So, First of all, I've covered up the artwork because I want each of you to grab a blank sheet of paper. I want you to hold it horizontally, get something to be able to draw with, ideally a pencil, but a pen will work. And I'm gonna ask you a number of questions. I want you to imagine that the work I'm about to reveal is the same size as your paper. I want you to notice the very first thing your eye goes to, and I want you to just draw a circle around that and put it on your paper where it's located in the original and about the same size and scale that it is in the original. All right, you ready? Where does your eye go first? Just draw a circle around it and put it on your paper about the same size and scale that it is. If your paper was this whole painting. Now I'm gonna give you three more instructions and we're gonna go pretty quickly through those. I want you now to draw a line that follows the path your eye moves as it goes around the rest of the artwork. You may not go to every single corner or inch. It's okay. Just draw the path of how your eye moves around the rest of this artwork. All right, third instruction. Imagine you've got glasses on now that are only letting you see geometric shapes. So now you can only see triangles, squares, rectangles, trapezoids, circles, ellipses. Start dividing this work up as if it's a puzzle, only of geometric shapes. You may see some shapes inside of each other. Maybe a shape might be tilted one way or the other, but work only in geometric shapes. So by now you can pretty much imagine if you're doing this with your students, you can adjust the time between each instruction as need be. Again, for the sake of wanting to cover a lot with you, I'm gonna give you the fourth instruction. I want you to darken in the darkest areas of this work, areas that are gray, lightly shade in, leave the lightest areas the color of the paper. And in this case, just work in large areas. So as you're finishing that up, again, if I was doing this with your students in the classroom, I'd have them stop at this point, go back to what your eye first noticed and think, why did your eye go there? Is it because of the subject matter? 
its size and scale, where it's placed in the composition. Were there other shapes that directed your eye to it? Or its contrast in light and dark areas? If anybody would like to share in the chat box where your eye went first and why do you think it went there? And again, if I was doing this with your students, I'd have them talk to each other first. That the same thing as the very first thing their eye goes to. So I'm seeing um, some people's eyes were going to the waterfall. A lot of people commenting on the contrast, the dark and light. Um, some people found the large tree uh, because of size and scale. And then more comments mm -hmm. about light versus shadow. All right. So again, Exploring that and why your eyes went there is something that I find people really fascinated with and making them understand that the artist had an idea of what they wanted to show, how they were going to compose it, how they were going to put this all together, realizing they started with a blank canvas. And the artist who created this piece traveled with a photographer, and the photographer his photographs as well as his drawings are what he used to be able eventually to do this painting. This painting is about 20 feet long, so there's no way he went to the Grand Canyon carrying that canvas with him. Take a look at it compared to a photograph and look at what the artist did in changing those angles, in changing the focus of the water and changing those areas of light and darkness and grayness. And then you realize I've not even zoomed in on this piece. We've not talked about any of the particular details. Instead, what I want you to focus on is that those compositional elements. In other words, I want you to focus on what the artist was doing to manipulate your eyes. And once you start teaching this to students, once you help them understand these elements, practice it over and over again. It's a great exercise to be able to use on anything. So I wanted to mention that when you see a blue arrow down here in the corner, that that it take you back to that table of contents. And you then can pick another topic. But before we do that, I do want to mention Another example of to see is to think, and that is bringing in music. Now, I've keyed up two different pieces of music, but I think you're all pretty smart enough that you can make a guess without me playing those. One of these was inspired by a chant, and one of these was inspired by rock and roll. How about a vote? Put in the chat box which you think was inspired by a chant or walk and roll. And in the notes for this particular slide, I've given you two examples of different uh, YouTube music that you can play in doing this with your student. If you did this with your student, then I would suggest picking a completely different type of music and play that and ask them how they might sketch or color to that new piece of music. These were both done by a painter named Ama Thomas, who actually taught public school in art and really didn't focus much on her painting until after she retired, lived in Washington, DC, and was inspired by her gardens. How are we doing, Helen? Any guesses there? Yeah, we have several guesses, um, and we don't have an agreement. Um, see, a lot of people at first thinking green was the chant and red is rock and roll, but 
there's a few people that disagree with that. Um, so I think we're all going to be very excited to find out. <laughs> so normally I don't ask what I would consider a closed ended question. In other words, you're either going to get this right or you're going to get it wrong. Normally what you'll find throughout the rest of my presentation is I'm asking questions that help you think and come to your own conclusions, but I can't resist with this one because once you find out which was inspired by what, take a look at how she's organized her patterns and see if that is any kind of a clue. And then again, if you do this with the third type of music that's completely different, ask the students to interpret that and think of it in terms of color and think of it in terms of pattern. All right, so now I'm going to click on that blue arrow, excuse me, that's going to take us back. And Helen, what did you find out for recommendations for what they'd like to see? Oh, we had an even slip between five different topics. So um, <laughs> if you have a thought, drop it in there and um, the, I'll add that to the list and see if we can get a majority. Otherwise, I'm just going to randomly eeny, meeny, miny, mo one. All right, what do you got? We'll start off with whatever's on that list. Uh, exploring history. And under exploring history, any particular one of the topics? Uh -huh. I did not get a specific one on that. All right. Well, let's see. Young America. Gonna... Thank you. Young America. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank we'll you, everyone, with... for participating in the chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Those of you who may have a familiarity with uh, our early history might recognize what's going on in this. My reason for covering up part of this print is to look at the different sections to understand the reasons for our Revolutionary War. So I might ask you what you think is happening here. Can you tell what time of day or night it is? How would you evaluate these people, middle class, upper class, lower class? What is happening to them? how they are reacting, and then show the other half and think about the action that's taking place here and then reveal both sides together and ask if, first of all, you know what this is based on and are there any obvious victims here? perpetrators, victims, any thoughts? And while Helen's waiting for any thoughts to come in in the chat box, practice again. Where did your eyes go first? I deliberately cut off part of the print, but then as your eye could see the whole print. How did it move around? What elements was the artist using to be able to create a, a composition of where your eye would go? And you may, based on what you see here, you may see the name of the artist down here, Paul Revere. A clue as to when this print was made. Any reactions, Helen? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have the comments of on the left, um, they, I'm assuming the individuals, uh, seem unarmed. And mm -hmm. further, that those individuals um, are being perceived to. Um, to be less formal and possibly um, high class. Okay. 
um, and that the eye is drawn to action in the foreground. In the foreground. Great, thank you. So most of the time we find that students are kind of familiar with the Bloody Massacre and what instigated the firing of the British at the colonists at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So besides giving an historical context to this piece, which I am not gonna do again for the sake of time, but rather look at this as what its intent was. Paul Revere created this three weeks after the British fired on the colonists. And history tells us that the colonists were the ones who threw sticks and stones and called names to the British soldiers until one of them fired and then the rest followed suit. So in doing this particular image and showing colonists dying, Paul Revere, what's Paul Revere's message? He went around and sold this and in selling it, tried to earn money for the cause. Think about whose side he might be on and what is he trying to generate? And as you're thinking about that, think about why he would put a dog standing down here when all this firing is going on. What does a dog symbolize? So speaking of questions, you can see I'm throwing a lot of them out here very quickly. So there's a thought that a dog might symbolize loyalty. Mm. Um, and that it might it's interesting to note that the dog is looking at the viewer as opposed to people in the image. Good point. And as you probably know, would not be standing still there when all this is going on. But definitely, if you've got it on the side that Paul Revere wants you to feel loyal to, he's going to have the dog there and ask you, where do you stand? So after we would analyze this with your students and what parts of it are fact, what are fiction, what's Paul Revere's idea for doing this, then we would ask you to take a look at a painting created more than 170 years later by an African-American artist, same subject. I wanna go back for a second and I want you to now take a look at a particular figure. We know women were not present when the firing was going, they were not in the crowd when the firing was going on. But we do know that women were asked to testify at a trial that took place as to what they heard about the beginning of this fight. So keeping all that in mind, you've got an artist, William H. Johnson, who replicates that pose with these women back here. So we know he did his history, but take a look at the position of this man and what he's wearing compared to the men that are over here and then the center of attention. Think of how his message compares to Paul Revere's. And we would ask students to do that kind of comparison. Think about what he's trying to symbolize with the women in this position. We don't have any writings that directly explain it, but we do surmise from that, that he's familiar with Paul Revere's print. But he named this Crispus Attucks. And that history records is the first man who was shot at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. He was a free black man and also part American Indian. So here you've got an African-American artist showing the same event but telling you a completely different part of that story. And if I was gonna show this to your students, I would ask them to think about making sure that any particular event they're gonna study, 
look at it from as many different points of views as possible to understand and derive for yourself what you think is the truth of that situation. So I want to now back out for a second. I've already introduced you to a lot of different strategies. First, I hid an artwork and asked you to take a look at its elements. I've portioned off part of an artwork to have help you look at different parts of it in depth. And now I've compared two works about the event. So I just wanted to point that out because those are strategies that you can use for anything. And I wanted to make sure that you understood, yes, you're learning about young America and learning about the history and give you different ways to look at and analyze an artwork. And that idea of comparison, this work is of a grandmother and his grandson who have come to America before we became an independent nation. And think about the choice the artist made in showing, for example, their position. What does that say about their relationship? How about the clothes that they're wearing? How about the fact that the boy has an open book? Is it possible that his grandmother is teaching him how to read, or perhaps she doesn't know how to read. And then we would have you focus on the book and where his finger is. It's pointed to Hamlet's soliloquy, the part of Shakespeare where the famous line, to be or not to be, is spoken. And realize that that clue in this painting is asking students to think about where they would stand when asked, do you want to become an independent nation or still be under British rule? So this painting is, is actually asking you to think about which choice you would make and based on what you see in your future. So we actually look at this painting as a metaphor, which was done before July 4th, 1776. Keeping with that idea of young America, I want you to start looking at the top left-hand corner and just sound it out. Read across each line. Anybody have an idea of what this is spelling out? Or I should say sounding out. I can see some smiles. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to share what's in the chat or give you sure. a second? Okay. Sure. Um, so we have the uh, the We the People speech, uh, the preamble, and the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, great. This is done by an artist who contacted every state's DMV to ask for a license plate that had to have the spelling the way he asked it to be, because when you dig in a little deeper, you'll notice they're arranged alphabetically by the name of the state. And yes, the District of Columbia, of Washington is included. And you can go through and see where is Ohio. And ask students to think about the original wording, which I have on the next slide, that actually included the names of the first 13 states. But when he chose to do this, he picked the final wording, which does not name an individual state, because he followed what was deemed to be the possibility that more states would join. And so when the preamble was written, they didn't want to limit it to just those 13 states. If I was using this with your students, I would ask, 
what could they use today that would show the individual state, but at the same time convey the message that we are United States of America. All right, next topic. What do you got, Helen? Any from Celebrating Heritage or more? Yes, we history? have um, American Indians under Celebrating History and African-American artists both okay. asked for. Both have been. Okay, so which ones to do? Hmm. All right, let me go with American Indians first. And we have, we're lucky enough to have incredible number of paintings done by George Catlin. He was a lawyer. He's white. He was around when President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. And he was worried that all the tribes would disappear. So he stopped his law business, packed up his paints, got himself out to as many different tribal areas as possible. And at this time, we like to emphasize that American Indians didn't paint portraits of themselves. They didn't have access to the same materials that he did. They weren't trained in portraiture or perspective. So we we're grateful for him for documenting them as they existed during that time, which were was in the 1830s. So we could look at these for the symbolism. We could look at for how he depicted these people who were very proud of their lives and what they had accomplished. We can talk about how that symbol of a hand on your body represented that you won in hand-to-hand -hand combat with your enemy. We could talk about the different colors and the markings on them and also describe the tribes where they're from. But the reason I wanna point out to you today is that we're well aware of the fact that these were painted by a man who was white and who wanted to make money. This was now his living. So he wanted to think about not only being respectful for them and their lifestyle, but also create something that would sell. So we always make sure that when we talk about American Indians in our collection, that we compare that idea, those ideas I've just given you, with work done by a contemporary American Indian artist and think about how they chose to depict their culture, what's important to them compared to what George Catlin did. So this is by a Pueblo artist, Alasira, and he's using symbolism that's reflective of his culture and what's important to him. I don't know how much you may be familiar with it, so let me just mention a few things. That this represents a rainbow with necessary rain to come down for the crops, the mesas where they would be living, the animals that they would be living with, this one having a storm and lightning for again producing that rain, this one having a heart line to know what its energy is like and how it represents. And this would be its sun. And in honoring that culture indicative of New Mexico, the New Mexico state flag actually has that symbol on them. And again, with that idea of American Indians and how they depict themselves, the next work I'm gonna show you is by a contemporary American Indian artist. And when I show it to you, I want you to think of how it differs from other maps you've seen of the United States. And as you're thinking, let me zoom in on this one. How is it different? from other maps of the United States. It's 
Someone noted that the borders are blurred. Okay. Or less clearly defined. There's an observation that there are other names for places. Mm -hmm. um, and that it gives equal importance to Canadian and Mexican tribes. Okay. Um, a notion of weeping or bloodshed and tears, observations uh -huh. of dripping paint, again, blurred borders extending into land masses that aren't in quotations land. These are great observations. Yeah. So look at where you're going with that question and how it's asking you to focus on this particular work. And based again on what your students say or don't say, I might ask what's missing. And while you're thinking about that, I am going to get out of this PowerPoint because I wanna play for you a video of the artist talking about this piece. And again, the link for this video is in the notes section. But what was missing in that? Anybody want to write in the chat? Somebody asked, where are the states on the East Coast? Ah. And when you say where, you mean they weren't named? I inferred that. Um, if the person that made that comment, if you want to, yes, they, <laughs> they said yes. Yeah, they do it. All right. So you notice that there were some missing names on this map. All right. Let me share my screen again. And I'm going to play you an excerpt of a video of the artist showing quick to see Smith talking specifically about this work. I like to use maps because maps can tell stories. So what I did with this particular map is to erase all European presence. I eliminated every state that has a European name and I kept only the states that have Native American names because the whole place was ours until the invasion came, the great invasion. So I mentioned it would be short. And think about that last word that she said. Invasion, which is not a word that you normally think of when you're looking at maps of the United States. How might you use something like that in your classroom? Any thoughts? Sorry, I lost my chat thing, but um, I was typing in um, the fact that I like etymology. So being able to maybe look into what those original names for the states mean and how they see that reflected in the world around them. Ah, yeah, that'd be a really interesting direction to go in. Thank you. Any other thoughts in the chat, Helen? No, we did have some people start to ask questions if this did have to do with um, Indian removal um, and starting to make some of those connections, though. Yeah, and which would be an interesting way to take off on her last word of invasion and make those connections or think about how they are connected. All right, I'm going to go back. We can either do African-American artists or is there any other one that was as strongly voted on? I apologize, I was muted. I think African American artists had the next um okay. next selection. Although please pop it into the chat if there's something else that you feel strongly about wanting to explore. All right. So 
This first, this first painting is one of the earliest works we've got in our collection by an African-American artist, Robert S. Duncan, dated from 1859. So by now, we're thinking about just before the Civil War started and what symbolism do you see in here when no one had any idea how long the war was going to take what damage it was going to do, how it would divide the country that was already divided. So we'd look at this first for symbolism and also at the fact that at that time, what was selling were landscapes. And then I'd introduce your students to the fact that during the Civil War, it was really difficult for artists in the South to get supplies and certainly to have a market for anything they created. So most of the works in our collection were done by African-American artists in the North when we're talking about this time period. So I wanted to introduce this as an earliest example of skills that we've got in our collection, and then move on to a next work that talks about a particular artist who's known for a very strong voice and her band, Bessie Smith. And if we had time, I would play a little nugget of her singing, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. But instead, I want to ask, where do you see, what did the artist do to make you get a sense that there's rhythm and motion and music and rocking and rolling, you know, more jazz going on in this piece? How did the artist help to pick that? The artist is Romare Bearden, who used more of a collage effect. So if you could see this work in person, you would see paint, you'd see fabric, you'd see sketching. Some comments are cutting up of paper like blocks, motion of the musicians. Musicians look like they are in motion jutting in different directions, angles, and vibrant color. Oh yeah, great, thank you. Then we might take this piece and we might show a poem by Langston Hughes and ask you what words in his poem do you see being visualized in the painting? And most of the time when we do this with students, they start reading from the top to bottom as most likely you're doing. And they notice that swaying to and fro on his rickety stool and ebony hands on those ivory keys and talk about blues and why during the time of the Harlem Renaissance would the blues be an important musical accompaniment to life in the culture then. So again, I'm going through this a little fast because I'm looking at the time, but I want to end with a work done by Carrie James Marshall, who, if you're not familiar with his work, he just uh, unveiled new stained glass windows that replaced windows in the National Cathedral here in Washington, DC. The replacement of windows that had the Confederate flag in it, and it had two of the generals from the South, and the cathedral, cathedral felt that was not something that depicted what they wanted to say about Christian life and what they felt was the spirit of freedom here. I wouldn't normally mention that if I'm working with your students because I don't have examples to show you of that. I just thought you might be interested in that very current event that has taken place. But in this, Carrie James Marshall has depicted, you can tell, a certain person here who has a face you might describe as being fairly neutral. But take a look at her position. You may not be able to read the title of the book. It's Africa from 1413. And it's hard to read 
the titles of the books that are in the bookshelf, but they all have to do with Africa and African history. Kerry James Marshall prided himself on having read every art book in his local library by the time he was in fourth grade. What do you think he's trying to say here? And next thought are these thought bubbles that are above her head. I've covered them up, but if I reveal them, you're gonna see these words in that piece, in those works. And again, for the sake of time, I would probably first have your students think about what words they would put in those thought bubbles based on the background information that I've given them. And how does sob sob compare to their initial impressions? And we've got a short video that talks about Carrie James Marshall's inspiration and what he's trying to convey with this. And he basically summarizes it by saying, is she sad about her history or is she angry? Or does she want to learn more? So that would be one of the messages for this work. All right, so with the time that's left, we could do one more really quickly. Any thoughts? We had a few requests for social commentary. All right. This, I wanted to preface this by saying, came up with this topic based on what a lot of requests we got from teachers all over the country who wanted to know how their students could express their opinions, express their voices without necessarily going in the street and protesting. So this is all based on trying to give everyone different ways of being able to express their ideas and their opinions. So this is a painting done by Winslow Homer, where he actually went to the South during Reconstruction. It's a little dark, so I'm gonna lighten it to make it easier for you to see what's going on. But take a look at this and think about answers to questions I'm gonna ask you. How would you describe what the women in this painting are feeling? And I'm deliberately not telling you the title yet. What do you think is their relationship to each other? Think about where they are. Who might be living here? And what do you think they might hope for the youngster that's in here? So the name of this is A Visit from the Old Mistress. And there's no way the artist was standing in this shelter while this was going on. Instead, he put it together from stories that he heard about how now African-Americans were free. Do they look free? Do they look like they know what they're going to do next? So you've got Homer painting the mistress here in black, which seems to imply that she lost her husband, that she's now in charge. But think of what Homer did to be able to make them look equal. He made them all about the same height, they're looking her straight in the eyes, even the young girl, and she's daring to sit down in the presence of her former mistress. Now we can analyze all that, but I want you also to notice that you might need to squint a little bit out to be able to see. Can you see there's a light pinkish blush there? Homer originally painted in her hand, holding a red flower. And we know this because of putting what we call a raking light on this painting, which revealed this underneath a very light coat that he put on to paint it out. So we like to ask how that would change the meaning of this painting, how that would change the balance that's in here. If she was holding a flower 
coming to the abode of the African American women. And yet Homer painted it out. Think about what happens when you want to bring somebody a flower and <clears throat> excuse me, what that means. So we would start off probably showing something like this that would be a commentary during a time when the nation was trying to figure out how it was going to go forward, just like these women are trying to figure out how their lives are going to go forward. Do they need each other or can they go their separate ways? How are they going to survive? So I'm leaving you with a lot of questions because I want to take you forward in time to Marian Anderson who you may be familiar with her as an opera singer who made her reputation primarily in Europe. The Daughters of American Revolution, who have their headquarters in DC, invited her to sing in their Constitution Hall. But when they found out that she was black, they rescinded their invitation. This is at a time when Roosevelt was president and his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was a member of the DAR. When she heard about this, she rescinded her membership and helped organize the opportunity for Marian Anderson to sing on the steps of one of the monuments in DC. Based on what you see, I think your students could figure out who that is behind her. And a question I would explore further with them was, the importance of her standing in front of this former president. We also have a short clip of her singing and how she changed one word in that song. But again, I'm going to jump through this a little bit here. Excuse me. Be able to give you a few more examples about commentary and social action. Does this look like something you may be familiar with? So if students aren't, they added in the sun made raisins box. And again, asking them to compare what's similar and what's different. And then tell them how Esther Hernandez worked in the fields with her family in California, and no one told them the pesticides that were being used. She went off to college. Her mother started sending her newspaper articles about the pesticides. Using her art background, she came back and made this poster, printed out thousands of them, distributed them around the county for everybody to fight for their right and for protection. But she didn't stop there. She made a more updated poster. And again, taking that concept a little bit further. So we might ask your students, excuse me, their students, what is an issue that you think people need to hear about that needs to be explored, that needs to be talked about in such a way that people need to have a chance to be able to give feedback on it? What might you use that they're familiar with that you would need to change around to be able to get that message across? Now, as I'm going through this, I'm gonna be leading you into more difficult conversations. So I want you to think about how you might approach these with your students. This may not at first seem difficult. It's a Harper's Weekly print. That was the most popular newspaper read at the time during the Civil War. People would be subscribing to this newspaper because there weren't telephones or TVs or radio. This was their main source of information. So you would be scouring this image for any clue about what's going on with the Civil War. Now, this happens to be the Confederate Army leaving Atlanta. Do they look like they have lost the war? They are acting like they lost the war, which they did, which is why General Sherman Lee asked them to leave Atlanta. And once we would try to analyze the context of this piece, I would tell you about the artist Kara Walker, well known for her silhouettes. She took 
a series of different prints from Harper's Weekly, and she placed silhouettes over them. Look at the scale of it. Look at the size of it. Think about positive and negative space and what those words mean in terms of art elements and what it means in terms of a political element. But she didn't stop there. She cut out one more silhouette. Why face them in two different directions? Is she doing something that's of two different genders or one? What is she actually framing in the middle of this work? What does it mean to have that silhouette looking in the directions that they are? What are they blocking? And how ultimately does that make you interpret this work? So I'm trying to give you many, many different ways to approach a subject that could be kind of difficult. Let me do one more with you. A little bit hard to understand what this is at first, but they're tambourines. Lava Tom. As requiem for Charleston to honor the nine men and women who died in that shooting of Emmanuel African Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I want to give you a close-up of this work. We have a very powerful video. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to play it because of what I want to cover with you before we leave each other. But in that video, she talks about all the symbolism in this work, why she burned the names into black sheepskin, why she used the tambourine in the first place, and what music means to her and to the church. So if I'm showing this with your students, before I play that video, I would ask them to just make a list of all the different examples of symbolism that they hear her describe. And then think about some symbolism they would use today or how they might evoke music. And then one last piece for this work is an artwork that's called Manifest Destiny. And if your students aren't familiar with that concept, we'd explore that concept be showing, before showing them this work that's about 40 feet long. And the artist, Alexis Rockman, confers with scientists, with environmentalists, with other artists to try to understand what the future is going to be like. So I've just dealt with some pretty heavy topics, but I wanted to give you an idea of what you can do with that social commentary, social action. You can really dig in deep with that and choose what you might want to use with your students based on their prior knowledge and what your goals are. So with the time that we've got left, to jump to two slides, and here's where Helen and I would like feedback from you to get ready for next week. I'm showing you a very small example of all the different ways that we have used Sam's artworks to teach all these different subjects, as well as performing arts, music, visual arts, and so on. So if there's anything here that you would like me to explore next week, start putting it into the chat box. And Helen's going to give that information to me, and I'm going to put the PowerPoint together, the presentation together, based on your interests and needs that we could help provide. Now, I want to make it clear, this is different from those 11 topics that I just showed you. My job working with rural communities has been to create these all from scratch. These are not topics that we offer as video conferences. So whatever I present to you next week, I'm going to give you all those resources so you can take it and work with it on your own with your students. Those 11 topics stand as their own as video conferences, whereas these are making more specific to meet your needs. So I can go back and forth between this and one other slide that I want to be able to show you. 
but again goes into other subjects. So with the time that we've got left, I'm going to be on this slide for a little bit and then go back to the other slide. And if there's something that you don't see here that you'd like me to explore, please put it in the chat box. I will let you know whether we do or do not have something in our curriculum to support it. I'll go, there's a lot here, so I'm going to go back to that other slide. And with the time that's left, I'm now going to ask you, with the computer that you've got or your phone or whatever, what I want you to do is put in a URL that says learning lab. Dot si dot edu. Just open up a different window, and it's going to take you to a very powerful resource. The Smithsonian Institution has been working really hard to digitize as much of our collections as possible, and that includes not just artifacts, but conferences where things have been videoed, articles interviews. These are all now accessible to you through this tool. So if you get there, go up to that search tool and type in any term you wish. When you type in that term, you're going to have two links appear. One is going to about here where my thing uh, about in the middle of the landscape here. One is going to say resources. One is going to say collections. You'll see numbers that'll give you an idea of how much is available on each of those uh, in those areas. When you click on resources, you'll find that whatever is listed there, if you click on it and open it up, all of its metadata is going to come with it. If you go back to this page and click on collection, you can register for free and you can start as many collections as you wish where you can pull in that resource. And the great thing about this is you can keep it private and give that link to your students. So you've already previewed what you want them to have access to knowing you're giving them primary resources that they can access through your link. You can make it public if you want to also, but you can also keep it private. You can have your students start a collection. This is be Think of this as a way to be able to have a portfolio or to be able to put together a response to a, a assignment that you've given them. So you're literally having them do a board or their own collection. There are tons of YouTubes that teach you how to be able to put together a collection, but it's designed to be really user friendly. What I wanna do is show you one more slide. We've got things that we've put together from our particular collection and we've organized them according to subject matter. So you can see that there's history and social studies, English and language arts, science and technology, art and design, and those at home activities, as well as works that teachers have created that they've let us be able to put up on our website. So there's very easy, as they say, to go down the rabbit hole to be able to explore all these different options. I wanted to make sure that you had that in your resource book. So now I'm going to go back to these two slides. But again, please put in the chat box what you would like to go more in depth on next week, and I will see what I can do. So I wanted to leave these last few minutes for any questions, suggestions, 
but I'm going to toggle back and forth between these two slides just to give you some ideas. And also, you'll notice time-based media down here on the bottom left. That's where I mentioned we've collected video games. It also encompasses any um, movies, any films, any LED uh, particular works that we've got, that anything that has to do with something that is based on time and motion, that's what that includes. Any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat, but I do have a post-it full of um, topics uh, for next Good. week. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I did also drop the attendance form, uh, the link in the chat. So if you need clock hours, please fill that out. If you don't, Please also fill that out. It helps us know who is in attendance. We appreciate that. Yeah, if anybody has any chance to use this PowerPoint, you know, before next week, you know, certainly come and let us know. Oh, and I have a suggestion. I know sometimes it might be with all the you know short time that you all have to be able to put together a lesson. But I've done this with students where I've printed out each of these slides as a note page. So all the notes come out with it. And I've handed each student a different slide with those notes. And then I've played the PowerPoint and asked the student who's got that particular slide to be the one to stand up and read that information, ask those questions, help lead that discussion. So keep that in mind as a way of being able to utilize this, these resources. We've got six minutes left. Any questions? Thank you for letting me know that that form um, is incorrect. Um, no, please do not select that option. Please let me update that form and um, let you know that you can refresh that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, there are a lot of positive uh, comments and gratitude in the chat for all the information in the Thank session. You. We'll definitely take advantage of the learning lab. Register and sign yourself up to be able to start making collections. Oh, and I forgot to mention that with the learning lab, Anything that you collect and pull in from those Smithsonian resources, you can also upload your own resources. So if you take an image of something or if you have a video or an article, you can upload that to your collection. So it's a great way to pull together everything that you might have on a particular subject or strategy. So I hope to see you all next week or pull in somebody who wasn't able to attend today. Uh, if you use the updated link in the chat, that should give you the option to select today's date. Um, we do hope to see everybody again next week. Um, and again, we will make sure that the recording and the slides are shared out to you. Um, probably will come out sometime next week um, since we do have to do a little editing.
And thank you again, Peg, for such a fantastic, fantastic hour and a half of resources and demonstrations and questions. Very much so appreciate this. Oh, you're more than welcome. You can tell I love sharing all this. And if you have a chance to take advantage of our free video conferences, the people that work, I've trained them all, the people that work with your students, they're great too. They really ha help your students develop an enthusiasm for how to look at art and learn from it. I, I do have a question. How, how do you... Um pick presenters to print your to present your information what we've done is a series of trainings so there's been uh three different classes that have been offered over the years so some of them have been with us really for 30 years and others the last class i trained was in 2016 but that doesn't mean that they are old in their way of approaching it the great thing about it is that they know they want to get your students excited about art so if you go and apply and ask and request for video conferences make sure in the notes that you put in that you've had an orientation from me so that you're familiar with how i've presented that puts them on note that you'd be interested in possibly doing like that drawing activity i did with you but definitely they are been trained to ask questions, to get your students to respond, to have them start discussions with each other and be able to draw their own conclusions. That's one of the things we emphasize. I, I was talking more about like presenting them, being the presenter for your classes. Like, is that just locally where, where you're at or do you use regional people for different? Um, oh. I, I'm, yeah, as an actual presenter of the information. Yeah. No, we use local people because when we did that training, it was way before the pandemic. <laughs> so it was people who could come and attend to the training that we did. And then we do regular updated trainings, but now they're all working from home since the pandemic. And so they'll zoom in to you from home. I wish we had the capability of doing it nationwide. Maybe someday. <laughs> Helen, I'm so curious to see what ideas everybody suggested. Yeah. We have several. Um, there was a couple of requests for color, uh, design process, physics, math, geometry, music, persuasion, and propaganda, a couple for the Harlem Renaissance and World War I, World War II. And as we are approaching six o'clock, thank you again for everyone um, who attended or for those of you who are watching this recording. Uh, we very much so appreciate this. And thank you to Peg for joining us and sharing everything today. We will have session two um, next week. That's this Thursday, December 14th, um, again, from 4.30 to six o'clock. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all back then. Thank you.